My name is Randy Hampton, Public Information Officer for the Northwest Region of Colorado Parks and Wildlife. I want to welcome you to uh, this uh, webinar this evening. Uh, my job is to make sure kind of the technology works correctly on, on the back end of things. Um, so you don't want to hear from me much, but I'm going to turn it over to some of the folks that you are going to hear from tonight that are going to help you understand a little bit more about uh, turkey hunting in uh, Colorado. And uh, let's let's kick it over to Brian Posthumus from uh, CPW. Brian, uh, go ahead whenever you're ready and I'll let you introduce yourself. Great. Thanks, Randy. Uh, my name is Brian Postumas. I'm the statewide hunter outreach coordinator for Colorado Parks and Wildlife. Um, yeah, we'll be talking a little bit here. I'm going to pass it on next to Pepper. Pepper Canterbury from the Colorado Parks and Wildlife. I'm the Northeast Region Hunting and Angling Outreach Coordinator. Awesome. Thanks, Pepper. We're, we're very fortunate to be joined by lots of other folks from Colorado Parks and Wildlife. Inclus including Tracy Predmore. Tracy, uh, tell us where you're from and, and what you do. Hi, I'm Tracy Predmore. I'm the Southeast Region Education Coordinator. So I hunter, uh, handle the hunter outreach in uh, the Southeast portion of Colorado. Hi everyone, I am Kathy Braun, Southwest Region Education and Volunteer Coordinator based out of Durango. Pass it to Kathleen. I am Kathleen, the um, education coordinator for the Northwest region of Parks and Wildlife, and I cover the Hunter Outreach um, program. And I'm going to actually introduce our partners for tonight. So I am going to pass it to Elena and Jamie. Hi, everybody. Uh, I just want to start off by saying thank you for joining us. Um, turkey hunting is both a huge a passion for both Jamie and I um, kind of is what got us started into hunting. Um, so I was just uh, going to say we have five Onyx subscriptions. Um, if you don't know what Onyx is, it's a, it's a map app for hunters and you can track where you're going. You can download maps. You can see private public land. Um, so we're going to do five trivia questions at the end of tonight's session. Um, and the first person to answer it correctly, you'll be able to type in your answer um, in the Q&A section. So the first one to answer it correctly um, will win an Onyx card. So that's really exciting, an Onyx subscription. Um, so yeah, I'm gonna pass it off to Jamie and excited to learn more about turkey hunting with you all. I forgot to mention, I forgot to mention that they are the Rocky Mountain Sports Women Group. Oh, yes. Sorry about that, guys. I guess I forgot to mention it too. <laughs> now we're, uh, um, I'll let Jamie talk about that though. We'll get her going. Yes. So, um, can everybody hear me? I never do this right. Um, I am the co-founder of Rocky Mountain Sportswomen. Uh, we're a nonprofit organization based out of Steamboat Springs, Colorado. Um, and we are just striving to create a network of women um, who love just being in the outdoors. We do a lot of different events uh, online and in person. So if you go onto our website, RockyMountSportswoman.com, you can go to our events page and see everything that we have happening. Um, be sure to sign up for our newsletter and you'll be notified of any future events. Uh, we do lots of different things from fly fishing to archery to um, turkey hunting, our favorite, and uh, duck hunting, all sorts of things. So Give it, check it out, uh, sign up for the email list and you'll be notified of future stuff. Um, also on the note of the Onyx cards, I can't imagine hunting here in Colorado without them. Um, it's pretty amazing. Uh, you can do a lot of e-scouting and all sorts of different stuff on Onyx. So definitely worth um, sticking around for. It's a pretty cool uh, subscription. So um, I'll hand yeah. it back to Kathleen and- oh, uh, oh, sorry. And then we have a couple of oh, announcements too that we'll we'll announce at the end too, um, as far as a future event and um, a couple other things for you guys too. So um, yeah, we'll pass it on to Kathleen and we'll get started. Okay, thanks guys. Um, and then Randy, I think we are set up so that if you guys at any point during the 
discussion tonight, you have a question. Um, that's what they're running in the background to answer questions. If any of it um, is for the good of the group, we'll try to cover it. But make sure you go ahead and type in those questions as we go um, so we don't get too far ahead if um, you need some clarification. So welcome again. I'm actually going to start with a little bit of biology for um, the turkeys here in Colorado. So my challenge is to share my screen with you. So I'm going to attempt. Whoa. to share my screen. Okay, so for Colorado, welcome. We are uh, talking about turkeys here in Colorado and I'm not gonna read every slide and I'm gonna go fairly fast for time's sake, but just know here in Colorado, of the species across um, the United States, we actually have Rio Grande and Miriams here in Colorado um, for you to be able to hunt. If you ever hear hunters say they got a grand slam, they actually got all the subspecies um, and we are fortunate to have two here in Colorado. So that's kind of the layout. The Miriams are in green and the Rio Grande come in from the uh, east of Colorado. So the Miriams here in Colorado, one of the bigger things to note on them, they have a lot of white feathers um, at their back and on the tips of their tail. And that's, they're very white compared to some of the other species, primarily in the Western mountain regions of the United States. And that's just another layout of how we have them here in Colorado. You can get a few hybrids, but that's it. The Rio Grande's actually, um, they have longer legs compared to other species, hard to tell when they're on the ground, but they actually on the tips of their tail, that's a bit buffier. It's not as white as your Merriam's have. Your Merriam's are very white on that back. Um, and that's them kind of moving in. You'll see that Utah's got some close to Grand Junction. So we actually have them do come, they do come up the Colorado River for us, um, but those are your two subspecies. Just a little bit of nomenclature before we get going and start chatting about these birds um, without you knowing what we're talking about. But a male is a tom or gobbler, that's an adult male. A female is a hen. Um, a young male is a jake, so um, shorter beard, younger bird. And then the young of the year are actually called poults. So um, both male and female have a button spur. Typically the males will grow into a bigger spur, which becomes a trophy a lot of people like. Um, toms grow the beards that are modified feathers. They don't molt throughout their life. And so when you hear um, of a really good heavy tom, usually has a very long beard on him. Um, our hens actually though can also have a beard, um, which is almost 20% of the hens could have a beard. Male characteristics that we talk about, the tail feathers on that fan, those wings that they use, they'll actually strut around and drag them on the ground. They make a really good, strong sound. Um, spurs, but not necessary on all toms. I've seen some huge beards on some toms with zero spurs. Um, the beard, and then the gobbler part, which is that red, white, and blue head. These spurs are kind of typical of it growing out to that longer one where you hear somebody say, um, I can hang it on a tree, that's a really big spur, um, but they don't actually always have that. And sometimes they have a spectacular beard. So that's just the beard, a side view on a tom with a beard. The gobblers have that iridescent coloring. Their feathers are gorgeous when you can catch the sun on them. Lots of um, people who fly fish, you, covet those feathers to tie flies, but they're very gorgeous birds and um, red, white, and blue head uh, is what to look for. We'll talk about this in safety later, but red, white, and blue is not what to wear in the woods when you're hunting because that's what you're looking for on these guys. The more excited that male gets, the more white his head actually turns, but um, you are looking for the red, white, and blue of a male. A hen won't have that. And then... Um, Gives you a good aim sight at the base of the neck when you can see all that color. Um, this is just the basics, or the best part of this slide is to show that solid tail. An adult mature gobbler has a tail that's even. That rainbow on the top has an, um, is even in um, length. So occasionally there's a feather missing, but typically an adult bird is gonna have a, um, a good fan 
um, with even feather length. This is your Jake. He's um, typically in the middle is where it's gonna be longer. And that just has to do with molting once they, um, when they're young as a pole and then when they drop feathers and how they grow back in. So a Jake is actually gonna have that rise and not a perfect rainbow in the tail. That's a good indicator of a Jake. I have a question. Yeah. How, what's the average lifespan of a turkey? Elena, you're not allowed to throw stuff like that out. Oh. <laughs> I wasn't um, sure. I, I mean, I would have to, I have to look that up. I know it's in my notes somewhere. Okay. If anybody knows, feel free to let us know. <laughs> I would have to cheat on that answer. Um, the average lifespan is when, until I shoot it. I um. It's a great answer. If anybody has questions, please use the Q and A at the bottom. By the way. <laughs> <laughs> um, I was gonna say three to five. I just three, three, or four. three to five. You're right, Kathy. Perfect. Way to way to go, ladies. Good job. Three to five. Okay. Curveball. All right, ready? So the hens are usually smaller. Um, they're driving color for nesting. And like I said, they don't have that red, white, and blue head that you're looking for. But with in here in Colorado, and Pepper will talk about it, a bearded hen or a bearded bird is what you can get in the spring. So some people think that's pretty cool to take a bearded hen. Um, others of us like to see that tail fan before you shoot. But she's down there on the right, she's nesting. They just nest on the ground. Um, so that's her camouflage. She'll usually lay her eggs just in a depression on the ground, um, eight to 12 eggs. And she'll usually spend that time on the ground, but then she'll cover it and take nest breaks. And obviously a low nest success rate because she is on the ground, lots of predators get into that. With the poults, when they're born, the mom doesn't feed them. They actually just follow the mom around. And when she pecks, they peck and they learn that way. At night, she might actually um, put her wings out so they can roost under, so they can crawl underneath and stay warm. Um, they're super cute, but um, within a month, they can actually fly up and roost in the tree with the mom, which is super important because that's a safety uh, mechanism for these birds to be able to roost in a tree at night. They're super susceptible while on the ground, um, but within a month, they can join the mom in the tree. This is a cutie pie in the tree. This picture is actually important because when a turkey actually lands on a branch, they hunch back and that actually locks their feet to the branch. So once they hunker back, it's, uh, it locks them so they can sleep there and not fall out of the tree. So that's a little pult. He's about a, a year old, uh, a month old, excuse me, up in the tree. Um, I'm just gonna kind of get into the basics of the bird and where to find them with forage. And um, just always remember, no matter what species you're looking to hunt, habitat is super important. If an animal does not have four components of habitat, they're gonna move on and try to find better areas. So habitat is just the overlap of food, water, shelter, space. And if they can't find all of that, they will move in their areas. But um, they like open areas for feeding, for mating. You'll see them strutting on the edge of a forest, like to the actual field line. Um, but then they like the cover, forested cover or up in a tree at night. Um, but they do interchange through those habitats, just looking for um, food, which includes um, the young really do well with insects and berries and seeds if it's a good year for that. Adults will peck at anything and eat a lot. Um, they like small insects, small road, like lizards. They like berries and acorns. Um, a lot of our turkeys here in Colorado will actually um, seasonally migrate. So they will, um, in the spring, it's really awesome to follow the snow line with the fresh grass and the new bugs that are coming out. Um, so where the deer and the, or where the elk are and the snow line is a lot of times lucky here in Colorado to find your birds because that's a lot of fresh vegetation for them to eat. This is just a picture of them at night when they roost. Um, they do get up in the tree. If you're gonna go out and hunt, it's really awesome if you can get there the afternoon or evening before, see where they go up and then set up 
um, a bit of ways from here, but then call them out of the tree. But it is cool to see them go up in the tree at night and um, they'll get up, they'll fly up, and then they'll like dance around for a while until they find their favorite branch. And then they'll quiet up and head to bed. Uh, roost trees here in Colorado are not always cottonwood trees. They do like the bottoms with cottonwoods, but I have seen them roost in really tall pine trees. So just depending on the habitat they've chosen to be in, um, they'll get up in those tall trees for protection. They don't sleep on the ground at night. Turkey sign, what to look for if you're gonna look for track. It's a great three track, pretty big. Um, gobbler droppings actually most of the time are a J to indicate a male. And then the females, there's a lot of white to their droppings. And a lot of times you can find them under the roost tree and then in certain areas where they like to hang out during the day to take a rest. Um, like I already mentioned, look in the habitat, food, water, shelter, space. They're gonna go for that fresh growth. They do love dandelions um, and follow that melting snow line because that gives them fresh stuff to eat. And lastly, when they actually start their dusting, that's how they groom themselves. You'll find areas in um, within the habitat that look like something's wallowed down in there and um, kind of pushed vegetation aside. That's where they're taking a dust bath, getting bugs and mites off of them. And then this is just a picture of how uh, big that area could be. And that's a good indication you have them coming through during the day. So that's down and dirty and super fast. But next I'm passing it to Pepper if I'm... Yep, next up, um, I'm gonna pass it to Pepper for seasons, draw, and regulations. Okay, can you guys hear me? And you can't see me yet. Okay, there I am. You guys see me now, hopefully. Hi, uh, Pepper Canberry, and as I said, Northeast Region Hunting and Angling Coordinator. Sorry about my confusion earlier. So yeah, I'm going to talk a little bit about the hunting regulations. Uh, they're pretty basic uh, in Colorado. Um, all of the big game hunting regulations according, uh, you know, regarding um, illegal to hunt at night and um, hunting on private property with, without permission and stuff like that still apply to Turkey. But I'm just going to talk about the specific Turkey related regulations that we have. So I'm going to start with our season dates. Uh, the spring season starts April 10th and it will go till May 31st. And uh, it's different than the big game seasons because they uh, are usually only uh, a week or to 10 days long. So the turkey season is you know, about a month and a half long. So that's pretty nice. Uh, there's two types of licenses that you can get for turkey. There's what's called the over-the-counter license or there's the limited license. In the spring, you can actually hold two licenses. One must be over the counter and one must be a limited license if you're going to do that. And uh, the only thing you can harvest in the spring are the bearded turkeys like Kathleen was telling you about. So both of those turkeys would have to be bearded. In the fall, you can actually harvest uh, either sex on those turkeys. And uh, so it's, there's no evidence of sex requirement. Um, so legal hunting hours for turkey is different than big game. It's one half hour before sunrise to sunset. So big game is a half hour after sunset. Uh, so there's a big difference there. Don't get confused with that one. And then there's a few different methods of um, hunting differences too. Uh, you can use elect you cannot use electronic calls with turkeys. You can only use box calls, mouth calls, or slate calls, or any kind of uh, a manual call uh, for turkey. Uh, you can use the um, the synthetic decoys for turkeys, as, and so that's what a lot of hunters will do is they'll have a, a decoy or a few decoys out there, a couple of hens, maybe a tom, and then they'll do their manual calls and, and call those animals in. Bait is not legal in Colorado to hunt with bait. That doesn't mean that you cannot hunt on a cornfield. That is 
a natural or not natural, but a, a agriculturally grown cornfield. Some turkeys like to go onto those or in river bottoms where there's a lot of natural feed available. You can hunt those areas, but you cannot actually set bait, corn, grains, anything that would attract those turkeys unnaturally to your hunting site. You can also not erect permanent blinds on state wildlife areas and public lands. You can, you can erect temporary blinds, um, but you have to take them down when you're done hunting. A uh, hunting method in the spring is shotguns only, and those shotguns can only be capable of holding three rounds in the chamber and in the magazine combined. So any shotgun that you buy um, may possibly be able to hold more than three, and those shotguns are going to have to have a plug in the magazine that prevents it from holding more than two rounds in that magazine. So make sure when you buy a firearm, if you're going to go buy a new shotgun, don't assume that the plug is already in the shotgun uh, because the dealers don't, um, they don't have to adhere to that. They're just selling a shotgun. So make sure that when you leave the store, you have a plug for your shotgun or you plug it with some other method like a pencil or a stick or something like that. Make sure you check that before you go out hunting in the morning. Uh, the shot size for turkeys has to be a number two shot or smaller. Um, there is a turkey load, it's called turkey load, uh, and a lot of like, hunters like to use that or get the number two or smaller shot. No single slugs are allowed for hunting turkeys and no rifles or handguns are allowed unless you're hunting in the fall. Uh, you can hunt with crossbows and handheld bows uh, in the spring and in the fall. Uh, so last, of, uh, when you harvest your bird, uh, when you're lucky enough to actually get a harvest, there's a couple things that you have to do. You have to immediately detach and sign and date your carcass tag uh, and attach that physically to the turkey. Usually people will attach it to the leg of the turkey and then they'll get home. Once the turkey's processed, you can just put that carcass tag in the freezer with the meat. Um, and then you have to leave the evidence of sex attached. And in this case, the tag is called for a bearded turkey. So you have to leave that beard actually physically attached to your turkey until you get it home and you process it to put in your freezer or to eat. Uh, and then that's, that's the majority of the, the specific rules and regulations tied to turkey hunting. Uh, there's a lot of other um, regulations regarding not being able to shoot from a vehicle, shoot across the road, shoot into private property without permission, or hunt on private property without permission that are related to all of our big game hunting methods. Uh, so reading through our big game and turkey hunting brochures, the first couple pages will have the laws and regulations on them. And that's, that's really uh, a very important thing to do when you're going to go out hunting is no matter what, if you've been hunting for one year or 10 years, read through those laws and regulations because they can easily change pretty quickly from year to year. And all that new stuff would, should be in the beginning of the brochure. So make sure you get that done. And I hope I've answered any questions. It uh, doesn't look like anything's popping up on the Q&A. So, um, or maybe they already answered them for me. So if anybody doesn't have any more questions, I will move on to Brian, I believe. Um, I believe Kathleen, are, are you next with uh, the gear and firearms? Yep, so I'm on safety and gear and they kind of meld together, but I will, since um, Pepper just kind of talked about the rules, and regs, I'll discuss safety. And like I said, it blends right in with the gear. But with safety, um, as I mentioned before, when you're thinking about your clothing or what to wear, um, no red, white, and blue, um, since that is what people are looking for in the spring is they're looking for that Tom with that bright red, red, and blue. If you don't have camo, that's okay. Just wear neutral colors. And actually they make some really, not very sexy, but some Jackets and pants that just look very leafy. Um, you can see through it. And you can put this on over your clothes and you look like a bush. And so this is very cheap compared to spending excessive amounts on camo. Just be comfortable, 
dress in layers, be able to stay dry, and try to avoid very bright colors. Um, but if you need, just get a little ghillie suit or something to cover yourself up with. Um, so while I'm on that topic, a pair of camo gloves would be good, especially if you're in a blind, you stick your hand out, that's really good cover. And if you're wearing flashy fingernails, um, camo hat with a bill because the sun will always be in your face. And then just like Brian has in his little cover picture, just a face covering so that all you have showing is um, your eyes. But um, don't get too caught up in fancy camo. You don't need it. You just need layers. Um, the biggest thing we see when we introduce turkey hunting to people is they get cold or they get wet, and that wasn't fun. So dress in layers, be comfortable, always good to have more. Um, when you go to actually uh, in spring turkey hunting, especially on public land, try to stay put. Sometimes you do need to move into that area, which is fine. But once you get set up and set your decoys up safely, we'll talk about that. You want to put yourself um, with a tree to your back so that if someone approaches from behind to your decoys, you are in a safe position. You also want to be aware of where you set your decoys. And if someone does approach on you, um, that if they shoot your decoy, um, you're not behind that. Um, so that's important when it comes to talking and Brian will get into the, how you um, use your turkey calls. But a lot of times um, people don't know what they're saying to the bird. So they'll just put off a whole series of calls or if they actually hear a bird calling, they'll repeat that call. So if you have an idea that you think maybe another hunter is actually approaching you, you can put off a series of calls that you know a bird wouldn't do. And if they send it back verbatim, you know you have someone approaching. Um, do not stand up. Be very verbal, staying still, and yell and shout that you're there. It doesn't matter if you spook a bird. It's for your safety to go ahead and shout out. Don't move, though. Um, unfortunately, we have some hunters who shoot at movement or sound, um, turkey sound. So make sure you're good about that. I'll get into calls here in a minute. Um, it's not great practice to make a gobbler sound. That is what people are looking for in the woods. So you want to sound like a hen when you're making your calls. Um, and you wanna know what you're saying, and Brian will help you with that about, um, about how to bring a bird in and then knowing that you don't have another hunter coming in. Um, be sure you know of your target, observe it. So if you're the one wandering through the woods and you come up on a bird and you get super excited, make sure it's not somebody else's decoy or another hunter. Be fully aware, like watch it for a minute and make sure. Um, I mentioned try to stay put, bring that bird to you, which is super rewarding. But there's also um, a practice called reaping. Um, I do not recommend it unless you are the only person way deep on public or on private land and you know no one else is around. I would not use this tactic, but you basically hide behind a tom turkey and crawl towards a tom with your gun and ambush the bird. But you being behind this and someone approaching potentially another hunter, it makes you very vulnerable. You are behind a target. So reaping is not promoted. Um, I would not, I wouldn't do it. Um, it. It potentially puts yourself in a very unsafe situation. Um, a lot of people feel a need to hike around with a loaded firearm. There is no need for that. If you actually don't have enough time to load your firearm, remove your safety, identify your target and shoot. You don't need to be shooting at it. That sounded like a lot of stuff to do, but with in reality, with practice, it happens super fast. So um, a lot, unfortunately, a lot of our hunters with turkey hunting, the accident happens when they are crawling and their body or the vegetation under them um, removes their safety and pulls the trigger. And unfortunately, they shoot themselves. So just, there's no need to hike. There's no need to hike and crawl with it loaded. Um, be sure to be ready to stay out longer than you planned. I know a lot of times it's like, I'm only going to go out for the morning or just catch the evening. Now I can't find my car. So one thing I always carry on my personal self at all times, Pepper already mentioned your license, but I also always have on me, not in my backpack, a way to make a fire. Um, my ID in case someone finds me my cell phone charger and a backup battery because I might be able to get, if my phone dies with temperature um, or I've been out so long, 
it gives me enough boost to get an emergency call out when I find service. And there's also a flashlight or um, an, an emergency strobe. And then of course, toilet paper. Always need striking paper wherever you go. But those are always personally on myself so that even if I put my bag down and I crawl off, I have some emergency mechanisms for myself to keep safe. Um, for camo and gear, I talked about it. Nothing needs to be expensive. Always make sure you also have sunglasses that helps out, but make sure you don't have the flashy ones with mirrors. Um, just dull, but um, guaranteed you'll always be sitting with the sun in your face. It always seems to work that way. Um, for your shotgun, make sure the shotgun fits you and then make sure you're, that your ammunition matches your firearm and that you actually invest, if you can, in a turkey choke. So this is my turkey choke, it's ported, but it actually keeps the pattern, all the shot, tighter for a lot longer, um, and it's a lot more effective on the bird. Um, remember these birds are covered in thousands of feathers, so you're aiming at the base of the neck, and when your um, actual shot stays together longer, it's a very um, much more effective hit. So with that, this is actually the ammunition I use. It's a little more expensive, but it actually has three shot sizes that helps me with close yardage and farther yardage. Um, when you practice with your firearm, set up different um, yardages so that you know your pattern of your shot and where you're effective. Um, and in addition to that, if you have time before you're scouting, you can actually set a log out at your max point or at certain yardages so that as a bird comes in, you get a feel for a good um, distance for your shot. But this variation in shot size is highly effective. I think I triggered a question. I'm gonna give that to Pepper. Is there a restriction on lead shot? I just threw Pepper under. Sorry, that silly mute button again. Um, no, there's no restriction on lead shot for turkeys. It's only for waterfowl. And then that, I didn't talk about the archery, but if you're not using a shotgun and you're actually using archery equipment, there are special um, broadheads that can be used that help you with either a neck shot or if you're going for a body shot, it's, there's a special spot on the back, um, a triangle area that's actually a weaker spot than just aiming at the body. There's so, these birds are very strong birds. Um, so then I have down that, like I said, make sure your ammo matches. They make some magnum blends that are too long for certain guns to so make sure that matches. Um, if you have the luxury of a blind or a panel that helps some of your movements so that you're not um, as exposed and a small chair is helpful to keep you from fidgeting around. If you don't have that, I actually have a vest that I wear that has pockets built in and then a butt pad. So no matter where I sit, I have a cushion to sit on. And all my pockets have calls in them and um, different things that I need while I'm out and snacks, of course. But one thing I have found, women's camo fits me really well, but women's turkey vest don't have enough pockets. And um, I don't have someone who's gonna traipse my stuff around. I like to carry my own stuff. Sometimes I'm carrying stuff for several of us in the woods. So just find one that fits you, that's comfortable, and that can be your vest. Um, let's see. So then the next part is my decoys. They're sitting over here. So this is my Jake. And I talked about earlier that Miriam's have a lot more white on them. So this one actually came from Cabela's, already painted. But if you get a decoy and you know you're hunting Miriam's, then you actually want to paint the white tips to be very realistic. Otherwise, it's a very dark bird and it's not matching your species. I choose to hunt with just a Jake because I don't want to intimidate a tom. Some toms that look huge get super intimidated by even this little guy. So depending on the time of year, I might not even use my Jake, but I do not use a big tom or, and I do not use a strutting tail fan. And that's just a personal choice. 
Um, these are my ladies. Here's one of my ladies. She's just a hen. She's just standing up, looking around, very content. And then I actually have a laying hen. So she's just laying down, sitting on the ground, telling everybody, it's good, come on over, join the party. Everything's all right. So that's who I choose to use. Um, at least a Jake and a hen, and sometimes I add um, a second hen. And um, I think I'm on calls. So, oh, the most important thing right here. When you're carrying a decoy through the woods, it needs to go into the decoy bag. Do not carry it out and about. The other part, if you actually do get a bird, it's super cool if you want to take a picture for a second with it up on your back, because that seems like the picture everybody takes with this fan. Do not walk through the woods with that. People are looking for that fan, and they sometimes don't pay attention. Depending on vegetation size, it's hard to tell, and that you're just putting yourself in an unsafe situation. So decoys always go in your bag. If you can, put your bird in your back. Or if you know you're done hunting, if you're coming or going, throw on some orange. It doesn't hurt anything. Um, you're not going to scare anybody. You're just going to let them know you're there and keep yourself safe. Uh, for calls, so these are pot calls. And they're made out of different materials. So there's some that are slate, some are glass. And um, we didn't mention it earlier, but between Brian and I, we're not actually going to play our calls for you because it sounds very bad on the Zoom, but there's plenty of um, YouTube stuff you can watch. And um, with the Rocky Mountain Sports Women's Group, they have lots of links that can help you with support of the turkey hunt and calling. So um, this is my favorite, the Freak, and it's actually a crystal. This one is... Um, where you can't put your hand on it and get the oil. And this one's a glass one. They all make different sounds. Some birds like a deep sound, some like a high pitched sound. Depends on the day and their mood, just like all of us, depends on our day and our mood, what we like. Um, and I have a box call. This actually, this rubber band is so worth everything. You can use a hairdo lolly, but guaranteed this is the loudest thing in your backpack when you're trying to be quiet. But it's just made out of wood. You can get different types of wood. And it's a box call. Much, much louder than your pot calls. Not always as effective, but if you need to pull one in from farther away, sometimes you need that little bit of a louder call. Um, and then if you get good at it, a diaphragm call. So this goes in your mouth. Let me throw it. It goes in your mouth. And it allows you to not have to use your hands. So if you're solo or you need that last little bit without moving, that's a good idea. Um, what I like about this call, it actually has a band that goes on my leg next to my gun. So right on my thigh and um, I can stay pretty still and still run my call and then put off my shot when I need. Um, all those have special care for them and you can look at that online of how to take care of it. The other thing that I like to add for novice hunters is this is called a true glow and it actually puts a glowing bead at the end of your gun. So like last focal point is when you get set up in your firearm, you actually put the bead on the bird and you're in line because a lot of people get super excited. They don't line up in their firearm and they shoot and miss because they actually aren't putting that bead on that bird with your shotgun. Um, and I think I've covered all the equipment and safety, um, and we'll catch it if I missed it. So I'm going to pass it to Brian. All right. I, I think I learned a little bit listening to all of you as well. So, um, yeah, I'm Brian. Um, I'm going to talk to you, um, about a couple of stuff right now. And, um, I, I think we're actually a little bit ahead of time. So I get to talk extra long, I think. Um, I just want to share a couple of things with you. Um, we've got a, a Instagram account with CPW with our hunter outreach program. It's called Hunting in Colorado, all one word. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm telling you about that um, right away here because I'm going to put the registration link for tomorrow's Turkey Hunting 201 webinar. Um, I'll probably post that in the morning. So if you can think about, you know, hit Instagram, um, search for Hunting in Colorado, follow it. 
um, tomorrow morning, we're going to post a little um, link just to kind of promote this. Um, another thing I just want to promote as well is National Wild Turkey Federation. They're a great organization. They do a great conservation work. They do some outreach programs too. There's local chapters all around Colorado. They got an annual banquet. If you're thinking, hey, who do I want to who do I want to hang out with, right? Well, this is a community of turkey hunters that you can get out and, and hang out with them. So um, it, it, it's a good opportunity to go um, check it out, um, support a great organization. Um, and I, I want to put a plug into for Rocky Mountain Sportswomen too. They're doing a fantastic job of, of reaching out and, and getting a community of hunters and, and anglers, just some people outdoors together. So um, they're doing a great job. There's a lot of great organizations to get tied in with. So um, I'm going to talk about a couple of ideas here. So this, this very first thing I'm going to talk about is going to be some of the common turkey calls. There's a lot of um, turkey calls that are out there. Um, so, so these are the actual calls. Um, Kathleen told you what, what the call um, styles are. I'm going to tell you what the turkeys are communicating. We're going to talk about some of the noises that they make out there in the field. And when you think about calls, um, uh, the guy that's going to present tomorrow, he's probably going to um, talk about a lot more detail on those calls and, and, and talk about communicating a lot more um, so rather than just listening to the birds or just making a noise. You're actually communicating with them. It's a two-way conversation. So think about that when you're out there in the field. First call I want to tie in with is uh, the, the tree yelp. The tree yelp is going to be the first thing in the morning. The, tree, the turkeys are up in the, the trees on their roost and as the sun is starting to come up, they're starting to wake up, they're starting to maybe warm up, they're, they're anxious to kind of fly down and go feed and go do some stuff throughout the day. And they start talking to each other, they start communicating with each other. And um, the tree yelp is just a really soft, yo, 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 real soft. Once in a while, you'll hear a, a turkey gobble, right? You hear that out there. And, um, it's great if you're out there trying to sneak in and you hear that yelp and you hear that that gobble up in the tree. That's awesome because you know there's turkeys out there. They're on the roost at that time. Um, so so don't feel like if you hear that, you don't have to just all of a sudden jump in there and start calling right away. They're going to communicate for a little bit before they fly down. When they do fly down, they have um, what's kind of called the fly down cackle. They make a lot more noise as they come down. You actually hear their wings and, and all that as, as it's beating through the air as they come down. They make a lot of noise. So again, if you're out there in the, the field, maybe you're not right next to the roost, but you hear that, you know, okay, they're no longer in the roost. They're now on the ground and now they're active and they're moving, they're moving around. So you might want to start thinking about um, calling a little bit more, maybe trying to, to bring them to you. That um, fly down cackle, it, it, it's just excited um, kind of staccato no noises as they come down. Um, so it, again, you, you can listen, um, the, the nwtf.org website has a bunch of turkey noises, a bunch of turkey calls that are on there. So you can listen through that. And there's a lot of stuff online that you can look at as well. Um, listen to and, and get familiar with those sounds that are out there. Um, another call that I want to talk about, and this is probably your most basic call. You're going to use this, I think, more often than any other call. And it's just the hen yelp. Yo, 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 yo. Right. It just, you know, five, six, seven, maybe eight, um, you know, yelps that are out there. <clears throat> um, once they fly down, their yelps are probably going to be a little bit louder. Um, the, I, I think of the yelp, it, it's um, usually kind of like a location call. Um, maybe there's a couple of different groups or different flocks that are out there in the woods. And, you know, they kind of call. Maybe they, they try and locate each other out there. But, um, yeah, it's just a way to communicate with other turkeys, turkeys that might be out of sight. Um, maybe it's, it's a turkey that's yelping, saying, you know, hey, it, it's breeding season. Are there any good-looking toms out there? And, and so maybe it might draw toms in the area. Um, or it's just, it might be communicating some other things out there that we, we don't even know, right? Um, so the hen yelp, that, that's probably going to be the main call that you're going to want to do. Um, I, I, like Kathleen said, we're just not going to be able to um, share the calls tonight or how to do them. Um, but again, there, there's a lot of good online resources that are out there that you can, can watch how they say, this is how you... This is how you make a Yelp call and some of these other calls. The next call I want to talk about is the cluck. Usually this is just a single call. Um, maybe it's two or three that are, you know, kind of um, out there randomly. Um, but they, they make this when they're moving around. And usually it's a, it's a sign of just contentment. Maybe they're feeding. Um, they're just kind of talking to the, the other turkeys that are out there in the group. And they're just cluck, 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 right? They're just communicating, right? Just 
hey, this, this is where I'm at. Where are you? Just talking to each other. Everything's okay. We're groovy. Everything's fine. We're content. There's another call that sounds a lot like a cluck. Um, it's called a putt. And, and the difference in the two is a putt is super fast, super sharp. And, and one of them is, is sort of like an, a, a warning call or an alarm call. If you get most, like, like two, three, four of them together, that might be, you know, flee, run for your lives and everything. All, all the birds are going to take off. So you got to be careful that, that when you're doing a cluck call, it, it, you don't do it so fast that it sounds like a putt. I hope that makes some sense out there. Um, again, listen to some of those noises that are out there. I think if you're just a little bit more relaxed with your cluck calls, but if you're trying to imitate a putt, which you don't do too often, um, you know, you, the putt is just going to be super quick, super sharp. The only time I think a, a hunter might want to use a putt call. So kind of picture, you got a, you got a Tom that's kind of moving into your decoys and he's got his tail fan up and he's, he's kind of strutting and he's moving into your, your decoys. He's moving in there, but it, his head is down and you don't have a good shot. Maybe you're a bow hunter and you want to get, get that shot that maybe, you know, slices through its neck. Um, or you, you just don't have that great shot with a shotgun. Maybe you're like, well, I, I don't want to shoot now because his tail fan is up and I don't want the shot to blow through its tail fan. If you're up and ready, whether you're at full draw or you got a gun on your shoulder and you're aimed right in for it, um, you could attempt to do a putt call. It's not always going to work, but sometimes as that turkey is strutting out there, just strutting, all of a sudden you go putt, and now you're ready for your shot, right? Like that turkey is all of a sudden going to be like, what's going on? And that you might have a split second before it takes off. That, that's, a, that's a tactic that some hunters will use. It's not going to work every single time. And that, that's okay. If it doesn't work, that's all right, right? Just get back out there and go hunt some more. Another call, um, it's going to be a purr. It, and it sounds exactly like, almost like a cat purr, you know, purr, purr. And as, it, as they move through the woods, they may be feeding. Um, they may just be walking through. And if they're content, they feel safe. They're just going to have a really soft purr. And, and quite often this is mixed in with some of these other calls as well. Um, so it might be a cluck and then a purr. And then all of a sudden, yelp, 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 yelp. So those are some calls. And they're just communicating all day long. Um, there's another um, call that's out there. It's a cutting call. It's an excited call. It's not necessarily a danger call, but it's an excitement call. So maybe there's um, hens that are in the area or there's some toms that are in the area that are strutting and they're kind of getting excited because they want to show off for those hens that are out there. Sometimes the hens will actually get um, really excited and they have a cut and it might be, you know, cut, 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 cut. And then maybe that's going to turn into a yelp. So it kind of starts out, cut, 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 yelp, 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 yelp. Right, so sometimes you string together some of these calls. Um, you might do a cluck, a cluck, a purr, another cluck. Maybe a little bit later, you you in that kind of this this um, series with a, a series of yelps, yelp, 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 yelp. Just some things to um, kind of think think about trying to string those calls together. Again, if you listen to some turkeys that are you know real live turkeys that are out in the field. Um, you're going to hear some of the, the cadences. You're going to hear how they piece some of those different calls together and they string them all together. And that's some of the stuff that you want to want to learn how to do out in the field. Um, so you can kind of make some of that up. When you're out in the field and you do hear turkeys, listen to them, right? If they're not right in there, you don't have a shot, listen and try and think about what are they saying? What are they doing? Where are they at? How is their behavior changing as you hear the different calls that are out there? It's a good way to learn out in the field. I'm not an expert turkey hunter. I love the turkey hunt. I've been successful. I've taken people out. But I'm still learning how to turkey hunt. We all are still learning how to turkey hunt. So, so let's learn. Every time we go out, you ought to, be, ought to learn something different. Um, there's a, a, a gobble call that's out there. Um, that's going to be the tom. And, and usually what happens is um, this, this is just kind of how breeding um, in Mother Nature happens with turkeys is you have this tom and he wants to breed in the spring. And so he's going to gobble. All right. And so what oftentimes happens is the hens will hear that and they're like, oh, hey, it's time to breed because they want to breed. They want to lay eggs. They want to incubate. They want to raise poults. Right. That's that's just built into them instinctively. So when they hear the tom gobble, they get all excited. And a lot of times the hens are going to be moving over to that tom. Um, 
however, we're not mobile. We're not really that mobile when we're hunters out in their field. Usually we're, we're sitting down by a tree or maybe we're in a ground blind. We're not that, that movable. So, so what we're trying to do is we're trying to pull those turkeys into us so that Tom, he gobbles, he's expecting the hen to come after him or come towards him. And sometimes we can't do that. So sometimes we've got to do some different things out there um, to try and um, pull that Tom into us. And I'll talk about that um, as, as we move on here. There's a couple other calls that are out there that, um, again, I, I'm just going to make you aware of, but we don't have time to really um, talk about them in depth. But there's assembly calls. That'd be like if turkeys got um, separated or there's a lone hen that's out there in the field, there's an assembly call. Um, you know, like, hey, are any turkeys out there? There's a kiki or a kiki run that is, is kind of like, hey, we all got separated. Now let's try and get our family group or our little flock back together. Um, there's these really cool water drop noises that are out there. If you get close to some turkeys, I've never, I hardly ever heard that before. I got into a bunch of turkeys a few years ago and it's just, it sounds like a water drop and I have no clue how to, how to mimic it. I think it's just a sign of contentment, you know, within a flock. So it's just, just a cool call. Um, so again, check out some of the stuff online. Um, National Wild Turkey Federation has, has a bunch of calls. That's a great resource to start with. Um, there's also some turkey competitions that are out there where, where people can, can uh, compete for money and prizes. Those are, are fun to listen to. It's not really what turkeys are going to sound like in the field. But these, these people that are doing these calls, they're, they're imitating a lot of the different calls are streamed together for, for a show or for a program. It's very impressive. But just remember that, that what you hear from a competition isn't necessarily what you're going to repeat when you get out, in the, out into the field. Um, the field is going to be, um, you're, you're going to want to choose why you communicate. And it, it, you're, not, you're not necessarily trying to compete or show off with it as well. I hope, hope that makes some sense. Um, so I tend to use hen yelps most of the time throughout the day. Um, every 15, 30 minutes, maybe. I, I try not to overdo it, but every 15, 30 minutes, if nothing's happening, I might just yelp, 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 yelp. And I'll do a couple of those. Um, maybe I will, I'll throw a cluck or some purrs in there just in case there's turkeys around. Um, I'll throw that in from time to time, but I, I don't just sit there and call, you know, all day long, calling all day long. That's not how turkeys communicate. They are very vocal. They do talk as they move around, but, but they don't just sit there, yelp, 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 yelp all day long. So I, I try to hold back on it. What I figure is that when I yelp, turkeys can hear me. Maybe they don't want to come over by me right now but they know where I'm at and they, they may come around again in an hour or two hours. So as long as I, I still make sure that turkeys know that I'm out there in the field and I'm patient, maybe they're going to come, come back and they're going to check me out. So ho hoping that that helps. Um, box and pot calls. Those are great ways to get started. Turkey calling. Um, just got to remember that um, there, there's two senses that a turkey has that you as a hunter have to beat. Um, one of them is going to be eyesight. And so if you've got, um, a pot call and you're, you're, you know, moving with a pot call, they can see your hands, even with, with some camouflage on your, you know, camouflage gloves, they might see your hand movement. So having some type of a, of a blind covering, even a, um, you know, a nice little panel blind that, that you can look over, you can put your shotgun over. Uh, it's kind of hard to see that panel blind. Um, but if you can have a blind that, that covers all the movement below, um, you know, where your head is, um, sometimes you can cover up some of that movement. The other thing, like Kathleen was saying, um, if, if you get a, um, you know, some of these diaphragm calls, mouth calls, they're, they take a while to learn, but the turkeys aren't going to see, um, see movement in it. So you can actually put it in your mouth and you can call. <laughs> they're not going to see a whole, or yeah, they're not going to see movement. So what I'll do is I'll use the pot calls, I'll use the box calls out there in the field until maybe I hear a turkey or I see a turkey. And then I'm probably gonna make sure that I have a mouth call, real easy access. Maybe I, I stick it in the cheek and I just have that call out there um, so that when, as they're coming in, I can get onto my shotgun or I can get my bow and get prepped and ready to go. And I don't have to um, have hand movement. If you're hunting with a buddy, one person can call, one person can get ready to shoot. So there's all different ways to hide that movement. So great eyesight. The other thing you got to think about is they got great hearing. So if you're out there in the field, you got to um, try and keep your, your voice down to a whisper. You got to be very quiet out there because they can hear so much better than we can. And they, they, can, they can hear stuff from, you know, so much further away than what the, what we can hear out in the woods. So when you're calling, you don't have to be super loud out there. Um, you know, maybe if, if there's nothing going on, you're up in the, up in the hills hunting some Merriams, 
um, and you're just trying to do some location stuff, maybe you get a great big box call and it just rings out and maybe you get a response from that way up the hill. Well, now you got a direction to go travel and go after them. So um, ground blinds are a great way to, especially with youth, um, some new hunters. I don't take them when I'm hunting um, Miriam's too often up in the hills because I, I got to hike in quite a ways sometimes and I, I don't like the extra weight. But some of those um, panel blinds or, you know, there, there's things that you can take that are much lighter weight that still cover you, but it's not a full ground blind covering you as well. So um, hopefully that, that covers some of the those calls a little bit. I know so there was a couple of questions that were out there. And when I tell the other panelists, just, just interrupt me if we need to um, cover any of those questions. Otherwise, I, I know they're answering them as well. Let's move on. I'm going to talk about um, turkey behavior next. And um, we're going to just kind of break this down to a couple of different things. Again, we can go on and on and on here. And we, we just don't want to go on and on. I, I like hey, to go hey, on. Hey, Brian. Yeah. Sorry. I'm going on um, and on, aren't I? No, you're fine. You're right. You're fine. I was waving. But um, you and I may not have touched on it, um, or we did and kind of ran through it. But with the locator call, if you want to shock gobble, I know we like mentioned a little, but um, it is called a locator call. Um, you can get um, a crow call, a barn owl, which in Colorado isn't great. We don't really have those. Sometimes it's just a slam of your car door. Um, so a lot of times they get shy to something that other hunters are using a lot. So think of what you're not hearing. But if it's daytime, you're not going to want to put off an owl call. If it's early morning with no light, you don't really want a crow call. Sometimes a coyote call, Yelp, will work. Um, and like I said, when someone in your party accidentally slams the door, that's very effective. Um, but those are all locator calls that I forgot to talk about. They're available to buy. The most common is the owl. And um, it's just funny because that works in the east, but we don't have barred owls. So um, that's the who cooks for you call. A goose call actually works great too. A what? A goose call. Oh, yeah. That would startle me. Yeah. <laughs> You're the, yeah. the locator call you there's just in the spring these gobblers have this need to like respond to any like kind of sharp sound or surprise that they have and they'll just gobble out of surprise and it's super helpful for locating so we i saw that that we just touched and yeah. skirted but now yeah. you're up brian yeah yeah so yeah crow calls are great there's woodpecker calls pheasant calls there's all sorts of calls you can get out there um so yeah that's a good point um, lightning goes off and you're, the thunder, you're going to, you're going to probably going to hear turkeys and, and hens yelping out there. I've had that, um, a couple of times. So, um, so let's talk about turkey behavior. I'm going to go through this super quick. Um, the daily behavior of, of a turkey, you know, starts out at night, they're in the roost, um, sun comes up, they fly down. Once they fly down, um, they're going to do kind of an assembly. They're going to gather up. Maybe there's some strutting. There's some, you know, just kind of moving around. When they fly down, though, they're going to fly down in an area that doesn't have a lot of cover, a lot of vegetation. So short grasses, not a whole lot of bushes, other trees. Um, it's Part of it is safety as they come out of the tree. But the other part of it is they don't want predators out there. The reason they're up in a, a roost at night is, is, is primarily for predator avoidance at night. So when they come down, they're going to come down in a mostly open area. You can kind of put that into your planning. If you're trying to sneak into where maybe some turkeys are roosting, think about where they're going to fly down. And if you can find um, a way to get close to that, you're going to put your back up against a tree and get some cover most likely. Um, but think about where is the most likely place when they come out of a tree roost, where are they going to fly down? Maybe you can be someplace in there. Um, if you can't get that close, um, they're probably going to you know, have that assembly, then they're going to go feed in the morning. And that they may be moving. If there's agricultural fields nearby, they may go feed in those ag fields. And then eventually they're probably going to maybe come right back into the area. Um, they may gather around. They may have some breeding displays. They may start dusting. Um, they'll travel throughout the day, especially some of those um, toms that, that don't have hens to breed with. They may be traveling throughout the day looking for some hens that aren't, aren't gathered up with, with toms already. So, um, you know, I, I think you can hunt all day long. Um, sometimes they've, I've seen them feeding right in the middle of the day. Um, usually it's going to be in the morning and, and in the evening before they go back to their roost. But, but sometimes middle of the day, they'll actually be out in the fields feeding as well. Um, and then, uh, you know, they're back to the roost as the sun goes down. So, you know, think about that. That's their daily behavior. And think about how that, that um, the habitat elements and where they are in the landscape and where you can be at certain times of the day. Um, to put yourself at an advantage um, if you can. So um, there is a pecking order. I think it's important to, um, to, to explain what that is. So um, the toms 
um, you know, the bigger males, they, they have this instinct to, um, to breed and they want to dominate any other toms that are out there, which is really cool. And, and this is part of the excitement we have with, with spring turkey hunting. Um, so to, usually toms will beat up the jakes, right? The one-year-old um, males that are out there. Sometimes there's gangs of jakes that are roaming through the woods and they're almost like the, this bully. And sometimes they can actually be intimidating to a single tom, a great big tom. Um, so, right. So, so again, there, there's all this, these social dynamics that are happening in the woods that until we go out there, we don't see all these, these social dynamics until we spend time out there. Um, there's also a boss hen usually in any type of a flock. That boss hen um, usually has a pecking order above some of the other hens. Usually she's older, wiser. And sometimes that boss hen is the one that determines is, is this is where we're going to go feed or we're going to go over here or there. Or I hear a hen yelping, but I don't want to go over there. So, you know, maybe they, they lead um, a group away from you as well. So there's some things you can play. Um, and it will, I'll, I'll hit kind of how you use some of that in just a sec. Um, breeding season, just super quick as well. In the winter, they're in humongous flocks out on the eastern plains along the river corridors. Those rios might be in, in flocks of 200 to 300 birds in the winter. But as we get into the pre-breeding season, they start to spread out. They get into smaller groups. They start to show some dominant displays. The pecking order kicks in. A lot of times the jakes are kicked out on their own for a little bit, um, right? So, so this is all happening kind of in that pre-season. And sometimes, um, you know, maybe that, that might happen before our season starts, before our hunting season starts. So some of that is going on, um, you know, right now or the last week or so. Um, when the breeding season starts, the toms really are hanging out with some hens, the, the big, baddest toms. They've already established their dominance. They have already established hens. They're trying to breed with them. When the breeding happens, the, the hens are going to um, probably go off, lay an egg on a ground nest, pr primarily one a day, um, up until they get like a full clutch. Once they get that full clutch, they're going to leave that, that group of, um, you know, other turkeys and that tom, and they're going to spend their daytime incubating those eggs. They're no longer in the woods for other toms to breed with. So as you get into the breeding season and you get into the late breeding season or the post breeding season, there's still toms that wanna breed, but all the hens are gone. They're sitting on those nests. And so you can kind of change your tactics a little bit. You can have a single hen decoy, or even if you don't have a hen decoy, just the hen yelps might pull these toms that are looking to breed towards you, right? Hope, hope that makes sense. So late season, sometimes just, just simple hen yelps or a, or a hen decoy might be all you need to bring some of these birds that are out there. Um, I, I'm going to talk real quick about the um, uh, weather. Um, you can still hunt as long as you can do it safely if, if the weather gets bad. If it's like super, super windy out there, think about what, what would you do if it's really windy? You'd look for some cover. Turkeys are probably going to find an area on the, the lee side of a, of a hill, a drainage, um, a ditch, um, you know, some type of cover where they get out of that wind and they may be hanging out there for a while while it's that windy. Um, later on, um, you know, maybe you get a, a rainstorm that comes through. A lot of times you'd think, okay, turkeys are going to go into heavy cover and they're going to wait it out. No, they, they can't hear predators approach when they're in the woods and the rain is coming down. It's too loud for them, but their eyes are still good. So they actually go hang out um, and, and they'll wait an hour or so in a rainstorm and they'll just sit real tight um, all, and they hardly will move right in the open area and that they, they can look for predators approaching even though they can't hear them approach. So um, when it's raining or if you think that a storm is coming, think about if, if you're a turkey out in the woods, where's that open area that maybe you can get set up in the approach as they kind of come in. Might be hard to sneak up on them um, unless you want to crawl through the mud. So um, just some things to think about out there. Um, again, be careful if, if you get into a lightning storm out there. Um, there, there is some pretty severe weather that, that maybe you just got to pack it up and go. Um, safety first. Um, let's talk uh, some of the, the calling um, scenarios. Um, so if you find a roost, maybe you found it the night before with a shot call, um, not during hunting hours, but maybe you did some type of a shot call. You heard some birds up on a roost. You marked it on your GPS. Let's go out. Let's go after them in the next morning. So you go out there well before sun up. You sneak in super quiet. You try and get in an area where you think they're going to fly down and you wait there. And hopefully they fly down and you're either close to where they land or, or to where they're going to walk through. If you're able to, you can set a decoy out there, you know, pop something out there to maybe draw them in. But if you don't think you can do that, um, just sit there and just call. I won't call a lot while they're on the roost, just a little bit, just to let them know that you're there. They'll, they'll know you're there. Um, and then when they come down, then start doing some yelps, see if you can get them to come over. Um, but don't, don't give up. If they go feed, 
I've had them come back an hour later, right exact to the same spot. And we, we've had harvest opportunities um, an hour, hour and a half off their roofs. They just came back into that same area. Um, so some, some things to think about with, um, you know, hunting off the roost. There's a concept called um, run and gun. Um, this is a concept where you, you, you know, you'll stop in an area, you'll call, see if you get a response. If you do, you kind of set right up there and, and hunt from there. Um, if you don't, you know, you wait a little bit for a response. Maybe you move on another, you know, 150, 200 yards, do another call. Um, this doesn't work real well on some of the state wildlife areas out east or the smaller properties uh, of public land because there's a lot of hunters out there already. And if you're out there moving and, and running and gunning, you're, you're, there's a good chance you're busting up some other hunters that are actually sitting in place. So I recommend it, if you're going to do run and gun, you're going to probably going to be on some of the larger um, forest service properties, something that, that's larger. Maybe there's a lot more distributed hunters that are out there. Um, the concept, though, with run and gun, you go to an area, I like to, um, if, I, if I do it, I'm going to make sure I'm by a tree um, before I call. Um, that way, if I hear a response, boom, I, I put my butt down right there and I'm going to call right from that area. I want to have a place that I have cover immediately if I get a response so I can hunt from there. So I'll, I'll find a place that gives me a good um, place to sit down. Hopefully I'll see the approaches coming in. Um, so I'll call there. I'll give it maybe five minutes, 10 minutes, see if I get a response. Um, sometimes I might just sit down right there, um, just take a little break. If I don't hear a response, I'll go and I'll move a little ways. Again, I'll try the run and gun and, and try and call. Um, again, once you get that call, if it's a long ways away, you can start to up, um, maybe half the distance or, you know, try and get closer. But, um, you know, odds are you're going to get close enough where you're going to pull that turkey to you. That, that's kind of the goal is to pull the turkey to you. So you're, you're, you're sitting there, you're waiting for them to come in. Um, another concept is going to be, you know, just kind of um, either ambush or a stand. It's a blind. You're going to put decoys out, however you want to call it. But you're going to plant yourself down. You're going to get set up for the day. You're going to be patient. Um, you're going to do some calls. Like I said, some hen yelps, maybe a couple other calls now and then. Limit your movement. Limit, limit your sound. Um, use the ground blinds or panel blinds if you need to. Um, but if you get a response, um, hopefully it's not another hunter. I, I know I've had some uh, calling duels with other hunters out there for quite a while. I was all excited. Um, I've also um, heard what I thought was a hunter. And I said, said to some people I was taking out guidance, like, that is the worst turkey call I've ever heard. And here, here comes a flock moving out there. I'm like, shows you what, well, all I know, right, is the actual real turkeys. And I thought I was a turkey hunter. So sometimes you don't know um, out there. So anyways, uh, it, if you do set up decoys, um, you know, set them out in front of you, set them in a place where hopefully turkeys can see those decoys, they can kind of approach from an area, um, but put them in a place where if they come into your decoys, they're within a range that, that you've patterned at, and, and odds are you're going to be trying to get a shot, um, you know, 25, 30 yards. Um, some shotguns and ammo will go out to 40. They, they claim more. I, I think a 30-yard shot is great on a turkey. Um, you're playing the game of getting them to come in and it's a lot of fun and it's, it's exciting. Um, the other thing you can do just with some calling scenarios, if you got a Tom that's hinned up, the, 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 they're not coming into you no matter what you do. Instead of um, calling to the Tom, call to that boss hen and try and get her so angry that she wants to come in and fight you. And, and so um, if she yelps, you interrupt her yelp. If she yelps five times, you yelp five times. If she cackles, you cackle. If she cuts, you cut. Um, interrupt her, do everything you can to make her angry so that she comes over there and she wants to beat you up. If she does that, she may take that Tom with you. So hope hope that makes some sense. Um, and uh, just some basic decoy stuff. Um, Kathleen talked a lot about this. If you just want to get started, a lone hen is a great decoy to get started with. Um, it, right, that, that you're trying to bring the Tom in. So you're doing hen yelps, you bring them in. Um, and if you guys can see, Kathleen has an example of a hen or if you can see um, I've got a, oh, I think my screen, there's a hen decoy. There's all sorts of different hen decoys. Um, when, when Kathleen talked about her Jake um, that she has, that's great. So you're, you're kind of playing the jealous lover scenario. And so maybe you got a hen that's out there, but you got a Jake that's nearby. And, and whether that Jake is at a half strut or it's not strut, and if it's near that hen, you might have that big old Tom come in because that Tom is jealous that he's going to breed with that hen. And so he may come running for a fight. When you see that, it is, it is oh, it's so exciting. Um, there's a, a concept, I call it the fight club. I'm just making this stuff up. So um, it's called the fight club. But when I, what I do is I, I've got, um, this is called a funky chicken. Um, what you, hopefully you can see some of it. Um, it's a very skinny, weak looking Jake, very skinny and weak. 
and it, it plays into the pecking order. And if you can put that out there in the field, maybe it's by a hen. Sometimes you get other jakes or maybe a one or two, you know, a two-year-old bird coming in. It, it doesn't have a, a group of hens. They'll come in and wants to fight, wants to beat it up. And that can be, you know, exciting. I, I've had a couple of harvests where they come in to that funky chicken because it's so weak and they, they just, they, they can't pass it up. They just want to beat it up. Um, the other thing that some people will do is they, um, I hear it's more and more popular. They just have a tail fan. I don't know if you can see this, but it's a tail fan. They'll maybe either keep it right next to them. And if they see turkeys, they hold it up and they kind of move it a little bit. Um, or they bought, put it on a stake and they, they pop it in the field out in front of them. They don't even have a decoy. They just have a stake. Um, so th those are some different scenarios that are out there um, that you can try. Again, there's a ton of online resources out there. And, and I, I, I'm, I keep talking and talking. So I'm going to move on to the very last thing. And these are going to be the resources, where to hunt. Um, the Colorado Hunting Atlas is uh, on our website. It's free of charge. Great mapping program. Tells you the public lands. Tell you who owns, owns them. If you click on there, it tells you who the, the office is, right? If you want to call the local office, ask some questions. It gives you the phone number for that local office. Lots of information on that. So if, if you want to um, take a look at that online, just go to our website, search for Hunting Atlas. Um, state, Re Le state Rec Lands brochure is a super awesome resource if you want to hunt state wildlife areas, state trust lands, even some state parks. Um, the new one will come out um, later on this year. So this 2020 is still active right now. But it tells you all the state wildlife areas, state trust lands and state wildlife areas. And you open them up, it tells you the rules. Some of them won't allow turkey hunting, but a lot of them will. So that's a great resource that's out there. Um, the turkey brochure, of course, is great. They tell you the GMUs, tell you where you can get limited licenses. Um, you know, check out those maps for the spring um, seasons, the fall seasons. Um, there are limited licenses and there's over the counter. You got to know where you where you are hunting before you go out hunting. You got to know those rules. Again, read that brochure. Um, there is a, a website called the State Wildlife Area Finder, State Wildlife Area Maps. Again, if you go onto our website, type that State Wildlife Area Maps in and you're going to get another mapping program that just has a State Wildlife Areas. You can filter it that just says, show me all the State Wildlife Areas that have turkey hunting on it. And it'll just they'll eliminate all the ones that don't. It'll just give you the ones that are on there. And then you can figure out, do I need a limited license? Can I hunt that over the counter? Um, if you can get access to private property, right? Ask your friends, your family, your coworkers, you know anyone that has good um, turkey habitat. Do they own land somewhere that has turkeys on it? And if, if it is, right, ask if they, they'll let you hunt. And if they say yes, call me up and let's go together. I'd love to join you. Um, Scouting, I, I, I think scouting is great. Um, going out the night before a hunt, if you can do that to figure out where they're roosted, at least you know where the turkeys are starting the next day, if you can sneak in, or at least you know they're on the properties. Um, the other thing I like to scout um, during the summer, even if I, I'm gonna go hunt an area the next spring, I would like to go out and, and scout that area in the summertime where I'm not busting any turkeys during the hunting season. I wanna know how to get in there. I wanna know um, how to get in and out in the dark. Um, right, because that, that's when I'm usually traveling those areas. I want to get familiar with that. So um, those are some of the resources that I guess I wanted to share. And I believe we are going to move on to Q&A from here. Um, do we have any questions that we want to answer? Yes. So from the q and I've been watching it while Brian's talking. Just a few things to recap real fast. Thank you, Brian, by the way. Um, Brian and I both mentioned patterning. Um, that is when you actually take your shotgun to the range, try to put in your turkey um, choke, and um, someone asked about recoil. Yes, turkey shot turkey shells usually have um, more kick, and it's because they're usually longer. You don't have to do that. The most important part, in my opinion, is having a turkey choke. It keeps it tighter for a longer period of time. What I had showed you earlier, this is a mixed blend. It's a five, six, seven, which means there's different fallout points for different yardage. It helps you on closer shots and longer shots. Um, but what we're talking about with patterning is you set up at 10 yards, 15, 20, 30, 40, and you shoot at, I just print out usually a target of a turkey's head and right where the turkey's head meets the body is what you aim for. And you shoot at those yardages and you see the pattern of your shot, all those BBs that are in your ammo, and you see how it hits. That tells you a lot about if you're actually in your firearm, if you're coming away, shying up to it, you're not going to be shooting at what you're looking at. So that's a big thing we do when we teach. Um, if someone wants to punch you, 
We try to tell you usually to stay away from it. Your shotgun wants to punch you and I want you to bear hug it. I want you to love it in nice and tight. There's zero space when you shoulder and there's zero space when your chin is on or your cheek is on it. Any space you give, you will feel your gun more. So think about it. If I were to go up and I would just slug you, you're going to feel that more than if I start with my hand on your arm and I punch you from there, you're hardly going to feel it because I'm already making contact. If I have travel space, your gun, when you shoot, if it's not here and here making contact and you're hugging it, bear hugging it, um, you're going to feel it more. So I always tell ladies or anyone I'm teaching that's novice that a shotgun is to be loved, hugged hard, and you're not going to feel that major kick. So make sure you fit it in it. But the patterning is important because you're going to realize I am not good at 40 yards. I need a bird under 40. So bring it in. You'll learn a lot from that. The other question that was on there, how do you practice and overcome the kick of it? We don't have our um, novice shooters practice with turkey load. We have you shoot with regular ammo. So I have, if it's a five, six load, I shoot with six as a regular two and three quarter inch. And then if the gun can handle three, they take one shot with a turkey load to feel it. And honestly, with the adrenaline, with a bird in front of you, you're not gonna feel any Thing. You're not even going to be able to tell us what just like happened. Um, another person asked how you shoot and Tracy answered with um, some, or Tracy or Pepper, shooting sticks. They're pretty awesome. This is a short pair, but especially if you're waiting out there a long time, you can set this and give more stability to your shotgun um, and it helps you with your um, long-term watching and rotating. So shooting sticks are great. There is no um, rhyme or reason. Sometimes you'll kneel down. Sometimes you'll be on your stick. Sometimes you'll actually need to stand. It just depends on vegetation. Um, the other question about the fiber optics I showed, the True Glow bead. This is actually fiber optics. There is no battery in here. It's not battery powered. That's just the material of it. Um, where to buy gear? So ladies, we like to shop. Um, Borrow people's gear, go to the stores, try it on, see how it fits, and then definitely check out the women's camo and gear that they have out there. Um, I'm just going to throw it out. I love Proist. They It fits me. I love everything about it. Um, try it on, borrow it. Um, the beauty of a lot of places is that you can, like Amazon, you can order it, try it, and send it back if it doesn't fit. So as long as you're comfortable, you can stay dry, you got enough pockets, and it feels good to you, go with it. So there's no rhyme or reason or where we shop. We all find different spots. Um, I always promote local, but um, my vest isn't Cabela's. It's, it's, um, it's actually HS Strut, which is a turkey company. And it just so happens I bought it online and it worked great. So find things that are comfortable and then feel free to return them when they don't work for you and um, have fun buying stuff. But that I think is the Q and A, but I saw two more come up. Um, hey Kathleen, oh. it's, it's Randy. Let me, let me fire these questions out Thank for the you. group. Thank and, you. Uh, maybe maybe we can decide who in the group would be best uh, to answer those questions. Um, so a question came in. Uh, somebody wanted to know how the fires this past year, and certainly some anticipation of potentially fires again this year, um, how the fires might impact turkey behavior and turkey hunting. And I don't I don't know if anybody has an answer for for that one, but if so anybody, I can I can answer that one, and it right. actually depends on our moisture, but. That new growth is going to be awesome. It's going to be harder to hide. But as long as we get that new vegetation growth with the insects, the turkeys will still come in and use that habitat. Obviously, they'll roost in the transitioning areas where it's got better cover. But as long as we get moisture and the green stuff comes back, they'll still use those areas. But definitely for roosting at night, they'll exit those areas. And then it's a lot harder to hide. So if you can catch them in the transition from coming from cover, to those fire areas, that would be best. But as long as we get moisture and it grows, it's gonna be, there's gonna be food there. Wonderful, thanks Kathleen. And, and yeah, a lot of people assume that uh, fires are always all bad uh, for wildlife. And, uh, you know, wildlife in, in Colorado 
really evolved in a system that has fire as part of how that system works. And so, um, you know, most of the most of the wildlife is really used to that that fire, and it actually can have some benefit for some species. And that green up, that growth that comes in that that next spring uh, is magnificently healthy. A lot of great, uh, a lot of great growth out there. Um, so if they if if they get that that growth that pops out, and you see that green coming up, critters are going to be in there. Uh, another question that came in, Teresa was asking, uh, said uh, she joined a little late, um, wondering about what license to get for turkey hunting, whether that's a limited license in a certain area or just, you know, an over-the-counter license. Yeah, I'd be happy to, yeah, oh, I'm going to let. Nope, you're, you're fine. All right, all right. so I'll, I'll uh, try and answer that. So. In the spring, you've got two opportunities um, to get licenses, um, two turkey licenses. One is gonna have to be over the counter. One is gonna have to be a limited license. So we do have a spring draw. The back page of the turkey brochure tells you those key dates. Um, you need to know those whenever the brochure comes out. Um, I think it's late December. Um, so early January is when the draw starts and, I, and it closes relatively um, soon too. So you got to get those dates in there. You got to apply for specific limited licenses and, and you can get that bearded bearded turkey tag. Um, but you can also get an over-the-counter license. And there's certain parts of Colorado that you can hunt over the counter. There's maps in your brochure that tells you exactly, you know, where you can hunt. The, these units are over the counter. Um, you can just pick that license up and, and go hunt in any of those units. Um, the limited license, though, it is going to be limited to um, a GMU, and some of them are, are split. There's an early season and a late season. Um, so there is some more stuff in the, the fall um, season as well, but you can read some of that. Um, Kathleen, you got something to add? I actually just noticed Teresa's name, and she is actually one of my hunters. So you need to get an over-the-counter turkey tag um, for our hunt at the end of the month. So I just recognized your name. Sorry about that. But you just need to pick up a general over-the-counter um, turkey tag. Excellent. Thanks, Kathleen. And uh, Teresa was also asking about bag limit for turkeys. Yeah. I so on, on our hunt, you only get one <laughs> if we get one. So we hope to get you one bearded bird. For uh, when, when you are turkey hunting, you're only allowed to get one turkey for your license. So if you have a have, happen to have two of them, a limited license, and an over-the-counter, you only get one for each license. So, um, and that, that there's a cart, that whole carcass tag, right? That only goes on one bird. So hopefully that makes sense. Made sense to me. Um, another question coming in from Kelly. Kelly was asking, uh, as a novice, if uh, she gets her turkey, do we recommend that she takes it to a game processor or maybe does that herself? And any tips on that? For, for processing the bird on her own. I, I can go. Um, for a turkey, it's super easy. Um, just be in a space that you can gut it and get it cooled off easily. And then you can honestly just take all the feathers off. Um, the best Ziploc bag is one of those toy bags. It's like an extra large. Um, but you just can strip all those feathers off, leave the beard attached, um, and then that bird is ready to go, just like Thanksgiving. So in all honesty, it's super easy to process your own bird. Um, and then you can break it off into pieces however you think you want to um, cook your turkey. But I would not take it to a processor. Elena. Um, on, yeah, on our resource page, too, we have several videos of how to clean a turkey in the field and different ways of butchering it. And then you can go down a YouTube hole looking for a million ways to cook it, which is super exciting. So yeah, just wanted to say that. And that's RockyMountainSportsWomen.com, right? Yeah. Yeah. Excellent. Hey, hey, Randy. Questions uh, popped up too. hey, Randy, can I, um, I just wanted to add a couple things in there too. This, this is the way I do it. Everyone's kind of has their own unique way once you harvest in the field. Um, what I like to do when I'm out there in the field, I just, I cut, um, I, I pull some of the, the feathers off near the vent, um, you know, that, you know, where, where it does its thing, right? So down there, 
Um, I pull the, the, the feathers off, I take a knife, I open it up, and I, I create a hole just big enough for me to put my hand up there, usually with a glove, and I pull all the insides out as I can. It helps cool that turkey down from the inside out. Um, and then I can pull the turkey, I'll, I'll, I'll take the turkey all the way to my vehicle, but I make sure I have a cooler, I've got ice blocks in there. What I like is I, I, I will freeze like some of those little Gatorade drink boxes, just the little ones, um, freeze those with water, and I can shove that up into the body cavity as I'm transporting at home. And so it starts to cool from the inside a little bit. It's not going to get things wet. Um, and, and, uh, and, and I can go home and then I can do what I want to do, um, with a full turkey, whether I'm going to, um, pluck the bird or I'm just going to, um, you know, just kind of cut the breast meat out and the thighs and, and, and some of that stuff. Um, I've got a little thing here. If you want, um, there's stuff online as well that, that shows you how to make a tail fan out of it. You can save the wings. You can make a cape mount. You can do all sorts of stuff. So something to kind of remember your hunt later on. All right. Awesome stuff. I have learned a ton uh, myself tonight, so that's a lot of fun. But we have uh, we have some questions for uh, for folks, um, some trivia questions and some some really cool prizes from Onyx. Um, and as Elena explained earlier, Onyx is a fabulous mapping app company, um, just some really great product that they put out. If you're not familiar with their product, check them out. You can Google search them online. It's uh, just like it sounds on O N and the letter X Onyx. And uh, like I said, mapping app, but uh, we've got some subscription cards. Um, and uh, let's see who wants to, who wants to ask questions? Kathleen, Kathleen I was going to see if you wanted to ask the questions and me and Jamie will just be here. <laughs> and then now we'll ask the questions. First person to get the right answer to us in the Q&A section. So if you haven't been one of those folks that's jumped into that Q&A section, all you have to do is click on the Q&A down at the bottom of your screen, and you can then type in your answers there, first correct answer to each question. And how many of those cards do we have, Jamie? Five. Yes, and what are they, what are they for? What do, what, what do the winners receive? <laughs> They're for a year subscription to OnX. So you get a full year of playing with it, turkey season, elk season, deer, whatever you're hunting, you get a full year to play with it. You can make different uh, pinpoints in it for where you found antler sheds, turkey sign, elk sign, all sorts of stuff. So um, pretty cool, pretty cool thing. Yeah, and then there's actually on our resource page again that we created, um, there's a, an article from Onyx on how to use it for turkey hunting. Um, so that's a great website too, and you can find that on our resource page as well. Yeah, super fabulous stuff for, especially for public land hunters that are out there that are saying, hey, I don't know, you know, how do I, uh, how, how do I know exactly where that private land and that public land line is and all of those things and Onyx can, can really help get you there. Um, a lot of peace of mind in that, in that app. So um, Kathleen's going to ask some questions, I guess, and we will, uh, we'll see who was paying attention. Kathleen, jump on in. Yeah, we're going to see if I paid attention before we got on this thing. All right. So first question. So the way this works, I ask a question and um, Kathy and Tracy are watching the Q&A. First person who types in the correct answer is the winner of the first card. So what two subspecies of turkey are found here in Colorado? Ba -na 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 -na. <laughs> that was absolutely oh, incredible. Man, that's fast work, peeps. The Good work, everybody. With which yeah. all of that came in. That, that was incredible. I, that I, is I, incredible. You, wow. You, you, okay. You are all super fast. That was crazy, I guess. Someone, someone put Miriam and the other one, um, which is not, <laughs> which is not the, the correct answer. Um, but uh, looks like Jessica you... Pagel had the correct answer fastest for for Miriam's and Rio Grande. Hey, so. somebody write that down and then we'll get um, we'll get back to you guys. Okay. Yes, wait, oh, and also I was gonna mention it, all of those of you who win, um, just shoot us an email. It's super quick. It's Rocky Mountains for 
Cool. Rocky Mountain Sportswoman at gmail.com. I know. Lena. <laughs> Sorry, I should have said it at the end. Killing <laughs> questions, people. She's giving away answers. Okay. All right. Um, Hang on a second. I, I have got to clear all this mess of all those people. 12 people jumped in with the, the answer. That was awesome, you guys. Good work. Obviously. We need okay. harder questions, Kathleen. Okay, question two. Name a type of call or the name of a call you would use to call a bird in. So either the physical item you'd use oh, or- you, you can stop talking now because they're all coming in. Jeez a wheeze, peeps. Flash well, and fast. These way to pay are, attention. We, you guys must be brilliant teachers or we had a brilliant crowd tonight. I think we um, had a brilliant crowd, that's, but- That's probably true too. I think it's um, Julie Scohe with a box call. Nice. So Julie, congratulations. You've Jamie, got- are you writing these down? Uh, Jamie I'm, and Randy. Okay, Randy's I'm got them too. I'm writing them down. So, yeah, okay, so we'll- cool. We'll be okay there. And as long as everybody's using real names and email addresses and stuff, we can find you. But once again, send an email to uh, Rocky Mountain Sportswomen at gmail.com and you will get that. Um, all right. So let's get that cleared again. And we'll go with another question when you're ready, Kathleen. Yeah, now I'm getting stumped. But all right. What shape is typically a gobbler's poop? <laughs> That wasn't, that wasn't one from earlier, but I thought people, I got it. People were paying, definitely paying attention to gobbler poop. That's awesome. <laughs> <laughs> All That's right, funny. let's see who who was fastest here. I gotta I gotta look at that. Um, so, um, Stacia Man was quick to the punch. Stacia has a your subscription to Onyx. Congratulations, Stacia. Nice job. All right. Um, ready? Ready? Wait, no, not yet. Hang on. Hang on. We got to clear them. You see, the, the hard part about that was that was a one letter answer. All somebody had to do was hit J well, and C. It could have been an S or some other weird shape. With answers. Okay. Anyways, next question. We are ready, Kathleen. All right. So. Is this is coming from Pepper? Is orange required while hunting turkeys? Ooh, that's a 50-50. And 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 lots of answers again. Please Are they right? Like really good at night. Let's 20, see. Look how many chimed in that time. Good work, y'all. Yeah, holy cow. And uh, I think everybody got it. Everybody Ooh, got, got it at the right. bottom. Did you see? Did you see? Oh, I do like that. Right yeah. There? See? Teresa oh, actually has a, a really good answer there. Teresa, congratulations. Um, not in spring. Yeah. Is like is actually the, the correct answer. Not in spring, Teresa. Like a trick question. Right. <laughs> Congrats to Teresa. Teresa. Hey. All the right. Last one. Wait, wait. Wait. Oh. Wait. We gotta we gotta we just gotta clear the screen or otherwise we're we're never gonna be able to accomplish this. I'm excited. I'm ready. Elena may have already done this one. <laughs> Number five. Or, or I can take over this one. Go. I have one. Oh, you're not good. All right. Go. You know, right? Is, is this number five, right? Yeah. Okay. Where, since I gave away the original question earlier, where is Rocky Mountain Sports Women based out of? I feel like we have people from all over so okay really really important question does spelling count no <laughs> well okay, spelling, maybe i guess well, so you yeah. have to at least be able to tell what what the answer was and and you kind of can alexandra sutherland congratulations you you were almost you were right you, you kind of got a little bit dyslexic in the way that the, the letters were too fast. Right, yeah. <laughs> flying along. Everybody's hearts are racing right now. <laughs> Alexander Steamboat is the correct answer. Congratulations. Uh, we are writing down your name, and I promise to try to spell it correctly. All right. Cool. Well, thank well, you guys so much. Um, this is awesome. What a what a yeah. great crew uh, this evening. Definitely. 
We have Anybody? a couple announcements we'd love to yeah, uh, share yeah, as do, Rocky Elena. Mountain Sportswoman too. Um, first of all, again, thank you guys so much for attending. We had great attendance tonight. Um, we had like up to 35 participants or something, maybe more. It was awesome. Um, so I hope you learned a lot. Turkey hunting, like I said before too, is huge part of mine and Jamie's like love for hunting. And I know Kathleen's too. She loves the turkeys. Um, and we have that turkey hunting resources page that I have mentioned a couple times before. Oh, yay. Thanks, Kathleen. She's going to maybe pull it up. Yeah. Um, and so last year we were going to do a clinic, but COVID happened and it was just too last minute to throw something together. So we actually created this page and we've updated it here and there. Um, and it's got all kinds of videos on turkey calling, a lot of our favorite uh, hunters that we admire and a lot of butchering. Uh, videos as well as the rules and regs. We need to look over those again. Um, also, we're doing a big sale on our website. So we have some merchandise, which is really cool. We're doing 15% um, off all of our beanies since it's spring. We're trying to clear out our winter selection, yet it still gets cold in the morning, especially if you're out turkey hunting um, and even in the summers when you're out camping. So uh, if you need a beanie, we have those. And we are also giving you guys, all of you participants for this turkey clinic, a special coupon code um, for our shop. Um, and write it down. The code is turkeygirl21. <laughs> um, and so that will give you $10 off an order of $75 or more. I do want to mention we are a nonprofit. So we, all of the things that Jamie and I put together as far as clinics and outings and trips, um, things like that, all the things we do is kind of on our own time. Um, so we always appreciate any support and all of our sales um, on our website do go to right directly back to Rocky Mountain Sportswoman. Um, so we'd love that support if you guys wanna do that. So $10 off, $75 or more, just for you guys. Nobody else knows about this code um, and it will, expire Friday night. So right before opening day on Saturday for turkeys. Um, give, then, the, give the coupon code one more time. Yes, Turkey Girl 21 And so you have to type that in if you have at least $75 in your cart, type in the code, you'll get $10 off. And Elena, so, is that all lowercase or? I guess all caps is how codes typically work. So I would try all caps. I, I don't think it really matters actually, but go all caps if, you, if you're going to do it. So, um, oh, and then I had one more thing I wanted to share on our website. I just posted a shotgun clinic. So I feel like if you ladies are very new to shooting guns, there's a ladies shotgun clinic in Bennett, Colorado. It's just east of Denver um, at, oh, I don't know if Kathleen has her page pulled up, but it's on our website. It's in Bennett, Colorado. Um, a woman named Kylie is hosting it from Pheasants Forever. Um, so they're going to go over the basics of shooting, uh, lunch is included in the price, and shotgun and ammo rental, um, all of that. So that is a great next step. If you ladies are in the Front Range area, um, definitely hit that up. There's information on our website and um, how to register and everything. We won't be there, unfortunately. We had we have turkey hunting plans, actually, but um, so yeah, but that's a great opportunity if you need to get more comfortable shooting a shotgun. Jamie, do you have anything you wanted to say? Um, well, I wanna say thank you to all of our panelists for coming on and teaching all about turkeys because I love turkey hunting. Um, and it's just a great, it's a great way to get into hunting too, um, being kind of a smaller game animal. Um, it's a little less intimidating. And also if you, again, we do a lot of different things um, from fly fishing to just hiking, navigation clinics, um, to elk hunting, archery, all sorts of stuff. Um, so go to uh, RockyMountainSportswoman.com, sign up for our email list and you will be uh, notified of any future events um, or discounts or things on our merchandise. Uh, also, just go on there and check out our events, check out what we've done and what we're going to do in the future. Please shoot us an email if you have any questions um, and we'll try to get back to you. Um, don't be afraid to reach out to us either on Instagram at RockyMountainSportswomen.com or RockyMountainSportswomen at gmail.com uh, for an email. So awesome. Thanks, everybody.
Yeah. Excellent. Thank you so much to Jamie and Elena from Rocky Mountain Sports Women. Uh, thanks to the, the crew from Colorado Parks and Wildlife, Tracy Predmore, Pepper Canterbury, uh, Kathleen Mowinney, and uh, who else was Catherine? Uh, Kathy Bronze was on with us and, and Brian Posthumus. And I think I got everybody <laughs> mentioned in there. Once again, yeah. hope you had a wonderful time and we look forward to seeing you on the, the next webinar. Have a, have a great evening, everyone. Thank you all. Thank you and take care. Bye.